What a glorious day. How good to be with you. How good to be in this place. It's glorious. What comes to mind when you think of the word glory? Perhaps an incredible night sky, a beautiful sunset, a spectacular garden, or a magnificent piece of art, a delicious dessert. Probably the most common and appropriate use of the word glory is when it is applied to God. We give glory to God in our worship and in our praise. We give glory to God when we follow the teachings and the example of Christ. Christ himself is the fullest manifestation of God's glory. We're going to look at a story in the Gospel of Mark that reveals that glory. Glory is defined as weight, worthiness, or honor. Think of what that might mean in our worship. The children helped us to get a visual image of glory with the use of some lights. This kind of glory would enable a person to shine in the midst of darkness. From 1 Timothy 6, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He alone can never die, and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Amen. To get a good view, you go to some place high, like the CN Tower or to the top of a mountain. An experience of God's glory might be considered a mountaintop experience. There are a number of such mountaintop experiences recorded for us in Scripture. To fully appreciate God's glory, we have to go back to a story in the Old Testament, to an encounter that Moses had with God. Moses had asked to see God's glory. It was a brave request, a bold request, and God answered him. He came down in a cloud and stood with him, calling out his name, Yahweh. God passed in front of Moses, calling out the qualities of his character, compassion, mercy, slow to anger, unfailing love, faithfulness, and justice. God's glory is revealed in his character. The natural response to an experience of God's glory is to worship him. Moses throws himself on the ground before God. This experience of glory left him glowing. The great prophet Elijah also had a mountaintop experience on Mount Horeb. There, he had an experience of God's grace in a time of need. Today, we're going to look at the mountaintop experience that Jesus had with his disciples. Three disciples of Christ receive a great view of God's glory. God's glory, though, would be seen in Christ. Listen to Mark's account of the transfiguration of Christ from Mark chapter 9. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then 
a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they only saw Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Jesus took his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, and brought them to the top of a mountain. The disciples, the disciples were to witness a revelation of the glory of Christ. Jesus is transformed before them. He doesn't become something or someone else. He reveals more of who he already is. Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. What might sound like a laundry commercial is really the writer trying to describe something that is beyond words. Jesus is revealed in all his glory. This is his future glory that he will bring when he returns as king. Unusually, there are no words of Jesus in this passage other than at the very end. This is about Jesus from the Heavenly Father's perspective. God presents his Son to the disciples in all his glory. This event is for the benefit of the disciples. There are a series of significant revelations given to them. The first is the appearance of Moses and Elijah. Both these men had their own mountaintop experiences of God. Moses was the giver of the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. Both law and prophets looked forward to the coming of Christ. Christ stands in their midst as the fulfillment of their writings. We're told that they were talking together. Wouldn't you love to know what they were talking about? It seems Moses and Elijah knew who Jesus was. Their presence was to help the disciples to know too. The next incident reminds us how much this special revelation to the disciples was needed. Peter clearly did not yet understand the uniqueness of Christ, and when he saw these three standing together, proposed the building of three booths or shelters, one for each of them. He wanted to make a small campsite. Peter and likely the other disciples put Jesus on a, an equal footing with the great prophets, Moses and Elijah. While a great honor to Jesus, the equation falls short. Had Peter truly recognized and understood who Jesus was, he would have proposed the building of a throne for Christ rather than a shelter. Mark graciously excuses Peter, saying he didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. And I, can, I think we can appreciate what an overwhelming experience this would be. So what did the disciples need to understand from the transfiguration of Christ? What we have in this recorded incident is a revelation of Christ as the king in the here and coming kingdom of God. What's, what happens next must have had a powerful impact upon the disciples. They are overshadowed and surrounded by a great cloud. This would, of course, echo the Shekinah glory cloud of the Old Testament. <clears throat> this kind of cloud was a symbol of the presence and power of God. We have this example from Exodus 24. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. A voice speaks from the cloud, addresses the disciples, and says, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. These are similar words that the Lord spoke to Jesus 
at his baptism. Here they are addressed to the disciples. The disciples were struggling to understand what Jesus meant when he talked of suffering, dying, and being raised again. It could be that this incident is the development of the words Jesus spoke to his disciples earlier from Mark chapter 8. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If the disciples had any doubts about the Father's glory manifest in his Son, those doubts were dispelled by this incident. The uniqueness and divinity of Christ was emphasized or underlined when suddenly Moses and Elijah were gone <laughs> and only Christ remained. Before we head down the mountain, let's consider what we have learned from this unveiling of Christ as king. This was a king who would first receive a crown of thorns. He would first be lifted up on a cross cross before he is exalted to the right hand of God. What this means for us is a call to worship. He is worthy of our praise. We are to give him glory. It says in our call to worship from Revelation 4 and 5, he is worthy to receive glory, honor, and praise. He is certainly worthy of our allegiance. This is a glory given to the Lord. We give glory to God in worship, but is there a way that we can receive glory? The answer is yes. The church, as the body of Christ, shares in the glory of Christ. It means that we can have a taste of glory now. Paul wrote in Romans 8, And we know that God causes everything to work together, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Jesus puts us in right relationship with God, then gives us his glory. This is a glory evident in the church, in the people of God. As the church, we testify to Christ in his glory. We are witnesses of the glory of Christ. From John 1, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. In Christ, we can help share this glory. We can give the world glimpses of glory. We do that as Christ called us to be the light of the world. We need to put on the lights. The transfiguration of Christ reminds us and demonstrates to us the possibilities of life transformation in Christ. He makes us new in ways that can be obvious to others. It makes sense to me that we should pay attention to the words of God given to the disciples. This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Pay attention to Christ. It is in listening to and obeying the teaching and example of Christ that we truly reflect his glory. There is glory displayed in loving, in sharing, and in giving. There is glory in serving others. There is glory in compassion and care. These are the lights we wear. The disciples were instructed to be quiet about what they had experienced of the glory of Christ until after the resurrection. A resurrection implies a death. Christ would also reveal his glory on a cross. For a while, the disciples were to be quiet about this glory, but we do not have to be. 
we have seen Christ in all his glory. His glory revealed in his tra transfiguration. His glory revealed as the here and coming kingdom king. His glory revealed by his great love on the cross. His glory revealed in his resurrection, defeating sin and death. His glory revealed in his people, the church. And when he returns, the whole world will be filled with his glory. Hallelujah. It's time to put the lights on. Amen.